Good day, this is an overview lecture on uh, transonic aerodynamics uh, following the reading in your Anderson book and the other small lectures I had you look at. Um, we're going to cover a couple of key concepts here. There isn't too much in the way of quantification um, because uh, there's not a whole lot we can do when we get in this flight regime. We have talk about the compressibility correction critical Mach number, the drag divergence Mach number where the drag starts to increase rapidly, um, and at least two or I guess three um, methods we can use to delay the onset of drag divergence to be able to fly at higher Mach numbers before these uh, effects come into play. I put a link here to a really good lecture, it's uh, quite long, quite thorough on this topic. Um, this, it's from a configuration aerodynamics course but covers a lot of detail. It gives a lot of examples, I should say. So just as a preview, we've been talking a lot about subsonic. This is close to uh, an incompressible regime of Mach 0.5 and the flow over this foil. And if we ignore viscous effects, the lift coefficient is related purely to the angle of attack for a given geometry. Um, but as we go to higher Mach number, the Mach number begins to play a role in the forces on that uh, airfoil. Um, and we actually have uh, some nonlinear effects changing. So at this point, it's essentially a similarity solution. If we non-dimensionalize the velocity by the free stream velocity, and we look at that um, at different uh, Mach number 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, they're going to be quite similar shapes. Once we get to the compressible regime, this all starts to change. Um, there's a couple of different points which are labeled um, key points. One is the critical Mach number. It's not necessarily 0.72, it is for this foil. Essentially, the critical Mach number by definition is the Mach number, um, the lowest Mach number at which you have flow over the foil that is sonic or faster. So here, and it's shown here, there's a point here where the flow reaches Mach 1. So as soon as you increase the Mach number, as soon as the flow reaches Mach 1 in the foil, you've reached the critical Mach number. So you're at a new stage where anything above that, you're going to get supersonic flow um, over the foil. So you increase from 0.72 for this particular foil to 0.77. Now we have in this dash region we have an area of supersonic flow. Everywhere else it is subsonic. So it's subsonic up here, subsonic behind the shock, subsonic upstream of the expansion. After the expansion, before the shock, it is supersonic. The shock, being a shock, has a strong um, effect on the flow. Across the shock, of course, the pressure jumps. So essentially you have a very strong adverse pressure gradient. The adverse pressure gradient leads to a thickening or separation of the boundary layer um, and loss of lift at the same time. So you have an increase in drag because essentially you have thickening of the boundary layer, so a larger wake, and you have a drop of lift because you now you have high pressure behind that particular shock. So this is an unwanted effect and we have we call refer to this as a um, this drag uh, it comes from the shock. So as we increase the Mach number, the shock just moves back, keeps moving back until it's at the trailing edge right here. Um, and this is essentially what we can call uh, an analogous to an underexpanded case in the one tunnel that we talked about before. But now we're at supersonic flow, so we have a bow shock. Um, and this now depends on the, the details, but at least within the boundary layer and this little region right here, it's subsonic. And everywhere else, it's supersonic flow. Um, so the focus of this lecture is essentially right in this kind of regime right here um, from here to around here. And so in that sort of regime uh, is what we call transonic flow. And this is where the commercial jets fly. We have flow exceeding uh, the speed of sound over the wing, but the, uh, the, in the Mach number infinity or the upstream Mach number is subsonic. So we call it transonic. Um, just to start off with some ways of getting at uh, the problem, we could talk about compressibility correction. So, um, and this is really a thought for, for high subsonic um, flight. So Anderson has a nice history of this in the book, but essentially all the NACA data that we looked at was done in very low speed tunnels. So essentially incompressible tunnels. And what people wanted to do, uh, getting into the war effort another time was to say, how will these foils perform uh, as the Mach number goes to 0.5, to 0.6, etc. And so, um, 
to be able to account for the Mach number effects, you can either go back and run it at the right Mach number in the tunnel um, or use uh, what's called uh, these compressibility corrections. And there's a number of them, and they come from looking um, uh, from linearizing uh, the equations of motion. These numbers kind of pop out. So they're not valid as Mach goes to 1 because there's some, some assumptions in the development of these uh, that mean that we can't account for large variations of Mach number or shock waves or things like that. But um, So if we're getting in high subsonic flow, what is the effect? And we can see here that in the denominator we have 1 minus m infinity squared. So as m infinity goes to 0, this thing in the denominator essentially is 1. Um, and as it, is, it starts to go towards 0 0.4, 0 0.5, we can see that this will have an effect. It will be less than 1, such that our pressure coefficients are going to be greater in magnitude um, than they are to this case. So CP0 relates to the incompressible. That's saying at Mach 0 or as Mach tends towards 0, this is the um, pressure coefficient. So the tunnels don't have to test exactly at Mach 0 because at some point the effects asymptote towards the CP0 value. So if a plane is tested at 0 0.2 or 0 0.15 in the tunnel, that's as good as saying Mach 0 um, in terms of this effect. But because we can relate as we have in class the lift coefficient, the moment coefficient, these are the pressure based ones to uh, the two excuse me, did I say moment coefficient, lift coefficient and the moment coefficient to these pressure coefficients, integrating the pressure coefficients over the foil, this means we can adjust the lift coefficient and the moment coefficient um, for higher Mach number. So if we've already measured the lift at a given angle of attack at low speeds, to adjust for the lift at higher speeds and it will be greater, the lift coefficient will be larger, we'll, find, we'll just plug in our uh, free stream Mach number here. So. These are um, very handy adjustments that you can take, essentially take your existing polars and scale them to higher Mach number, and there's some homework problems related to that. Um, after, and I should mention that um, Anderson also mentions in his book that uh, I believe um, Glauert is the first one to sort of have put this down in print, but Prandtl had been using this for some time before that, um, so they both get attributed the, uh, the name. They did not particularly work together. Since then, there are um, some higher order corrections that come along. You can see just more complicated formulas, but the stuff that goes in there is um, is essentially this is say CP zero here. The stuff that goes in there are, is the same. So it's just you know in these days computers this is trivial, um, and this is the one that's been used um, typically by the aerospace industry since uh, since after the war. Here's a comparison, a comparison of these compressibility corrections. You can see here increasing Mach number, and this is pressure coefficient. We can think of this as a lift coefficient, um, or, or anything uh, becoming more negative here with Mach number. And the experiment, this was just testing uh, a NACA 4412, so essentially you have your foil at some fixed angle of attack, you put a little pressure sensor on it here, and you say, what's the pressure? You convert it to a pressure coefficient, and here's your tunnel, and we're adjusting the Mach number of the tunnel either by cooling it, or changing the airspeed. Um, so the Mach number is coming up, the alpha is staying the same, and we're only measuring CP here, and you can see the data from the tunnel, these little dots, and you can see the, the compressibility corrections here. So clearly, just in this Mach range from zero, or the lowest test in the tunnel here, which looks to be about 0.1, up to the highest test in the tunnel around 0.8, you can see in that range here, the, the pressure coefficient, uh, um, and thus the lift coefficient, varies by a factor of two, just about, not quite two. Um, and some other studies did similar stuff. A very, they're looking at a very simple analytical sort of camber study using this, this analytical shape, uh, and they put a little pressure sensor in the very top of that where you have the lowest pressure coefficient in general, um, and did the same thing. They were looking at the lift uh, and the actual Mach divided by the lift at, as the Mach goes to zero, and you can see here um, uh, this is 1.0, so it starts at 1, they're the same, and this increases, the lift coefficient increases with increasing Mach number, um, and these formulas are not valid, you can see in the limit as Mach goes to 1, the formulas go to infinity, so they stop becoming valid um, when you start getting, realistically, when you start getting shocks on the wings, supersonic flow on the wings. But up to this range here, it's a very handy way of adjusting existing polar data. Um, so again, the critical Mach number, we have this sort of 
different stages. We have incompressible flow. Again, we're calling this Mach less than 0.3, where the density variations in the flow are smaller than 5%, roughly speaking. We have high subsonic. So here, Mach 0.5. So we're getting to a World War fighter type Mach numbers. And the Mach on top is not supersonic, but it's high subsonic. Uh, and then we hit our critical Mach number for this particular fat foil. It's happening at 0.61. We're getting exactly Mach, point, Mach 1 right here on the wing. Notice that it doesn't happen exactly at the point of maximum thickness. It occurs somewhere before that. Um, so this isn't a complete analog to a tunnel. If we say we're, maybe we're squeezing the flow, you might want to think of it that way. That's why the flow is accelerating. We're squeezing it between, uh, if I mirror this airfoil, and thus I would hit my highest Mach number here. Um, but in reality, the case is a very complex two-dimensional flow field in this case and there's nothing that says our fastest mo highest Mach number happens to happen at the point of uh, maximum thickness and generally doesn't happen before it. Now we go to even higher Mach numbers now we have this regime of um, Mach rate in the moment. We refer to this to, as transonic and again this is where if you get a plane and you go to California or Florida your wing is in that regime. So these are some quick calculations with TS foil. This is a program available on the web um, and for 2D foil, uh, a calculation of transonic flow um, over a wing, uh, it's available in Fortran, you can just compile it, and that's what I did. So we have two different Mach numbers here, and I'm looking at a, a NACA, NACA 008 is the solid line, and the dash pressure line is the 12% is the thick. The 8% thick is the solid line. So if you look at this top diagram here, which is the pressure coefficient, we can see that, and this wing is at zero angle of attack. In zero angle of attack, we, we reach, once we get to Mach 0.65, we get a pressure coefficient of about minus 1.2 with the thick foil and a smaller peak pressure coefficient with the solid foil. And we look down here at this Mach number, we can see that we are, this is essentially the critical Mach number, that 0012 foil. We're hitting exactly Mach 1 right here, and we have a small pocket of supersonic flow on the upper surface. Um, actually, clearly this is, was at an angle of attack. These aren't symmetrical, so and I don't recall what that was. It would, be in a, would have been a few degrees. And we have a small pocket of supersonic flow on the upper surface of the 12% of the thick foil. So the thicker foil, everything else the same, we get a uh, higher Mach number, lower pressure coefficient on there. Um, I, I beef up the Mach number to 0.75 and you can see a shock occurs. So the pressure decreases, decreases, so it's accelerating over the foil, then it hits a shock and we have a pressure jump. Now CP remembers negative in this direction, so this indicates that the pressure is increasing across the shock and the same with this shock which is on the uh, on the thicker foil right here. It's a stronger shock on the thicker foil and thus it's going to have stronger effects on the lift. Um, we can calculate uh, this critical Mach number if we know the maximum pressure coefficient, or I should say the minimum, the most negative pressure coefficient on the foil at Mach 0 or close to Mach 0. We can calculate at what point we are going to get to this critical Mach number. So these lines right here, for example, where it says thin airfoil, these are related to the airfoil uh, geometry. And we start for a particular geometry, in this case a quote thin airfoil. It has some a minimum pressure coefficient, CP0, right here as Mach tends towards zero. And now we increase that Mach number and just from the Prano Blau relations we can see that compressibility corrections that the, that pressure coefficient is going to get more negative with the Mach number. A thicker airfoil will start with a, a larger or more negative pressure coefficient on the upper surface as we saw in those TS foil plots in the, in the previous pay, um, slide. And as we increase the Mach number, again, this is going to increase, <coughs> excuse me. This other line here, which I'll trace in red, is purely from isentropic flow. It has nothing to do with geometry. This is a fluid mechanics line. And essentially what it says is, if my free stream flow is a given Mach number, <coughs> excuse me, um, what is the pressure coefficient going to be if I were to somehow isentropically accelerate that flow to Mach 1? And so just thinking uh, just loosely in terms of Bernoulli's equation, for example, 
Um, if we're trying to accelerate the flow to a higher speed, at that higher speed we're going to be at a lower um, pressure coefficient. The Mach number is the key uh, non-dimensional, is the controlling factor I should say for isentropic flow. And so if we start at a lower Mach number here, and for example, let's call this Mach 0.5, once we've accelerated that flow to Mach 1, the, the local, the, uh, the pressure coefficient of the flow will be um, very negative, basically. It will be this value right here. If we're already close to Mach 1 and we accelerate just a little bit faster to Mach 1, our pressure coefficient is not going to be very negative because we um, barely went anywhere. Remember that the pressure coefficient equals zero in the free stream. As we go faster, it goes more and more negative. But we don't really have to increase it, the Mach number that much from here, so it will only be slightly negative. From here, it's going to be very negative by the time we get here. So we look at the intersection of these two graphs, and that shows you where the critical Mach number is going to occur. A thin foil can withstand a higher, generally speaking, a higher critical Mach number before, uh, it can get to a higher Mach number before the flow is critical compared to a thick foil. And what this shows us is that thin foils, generally speaking, thin foils are preferable for transonic and we will also see for supersonic flight. Thin foils are preferred over thick airfoils. Um, so we want thin over thick. Um, so that's just a critical Mach number. It just tells us the, the Mach number which we have some a point of sonic flow on the airfoil. But if we have a very sort of generic graph for drag, the drag coefficient um, on the foil, and so this is CD naught, this would be basically viscous and profile drag, and now we're increasing our Mach number. And once we hit that critical Mach number, now at this point we have supersonic flow up above. And now we keep increasing the Mach number, and it starts to rise slowly, and at some point it, you get a very steep slope in the drag. A small adjustment in Mach number leads to a very large increase in drag. And this is essentially known as um, what is known as the sound barrier. So there was thought that you couldn't get over this sort of hurdle. There's actually a similar hurdle in um, ship hydrodynamics when you start approaching a critical fruit number, uh, at least displacement boats, and you have this kind of hump. It's quite interesting the analogy. And um, so you get to this steep point here. Um, at that point, there's a just sort of sketch of what the flow looks like right here. So there's different definitions. I don't know if there's an official definition for drag divergence, but it has to do with the stiffness of the CD Mach curve. Basically, the, the rate of change of CD with respect to Mach passes a, a critical value, and you label that as drag divergence. And basically, any incremental Mach is not worth the gas to, to do it. So. Um, that's a drag divergence. So the key is, okay, we can compute, we can, we can estimate Mach critical. If we have low speed data from the tunnel, we can estimate, we can get it, the critical Mach number. Um, what we really want to know is the drag divergence, which will occur somewhere between Mach 1. We know it's less than Mach 1, and we know it's greater than the critical Mach number, but it's in here somewhere, and where is it? Um, so I put a very approximate relation here. There's a, a few more formulas in that lecture um, the Mason lecture that I put in at the beginning, but there isn't really a rule of thumb for doing this. You really have to rely on tunnels and you have to rely on CFD in order to figure out exactly where the drag divergence is. And then, more importantly, how do I take this and move it to the right? That's really what I want to do. Once I get to one where it's supersonic flow, that's a different game. But if I'm hitting di drag divergence at Mach 0.75 versus, say, Mach 0.85, like a modern commercial aircraft, that's a big difference in terms of flight speed. So you can see these trends in thickness. So again, you want thin, thin wing. Thin wing is one way to delay the drag rise. And so you can see this progression. Um, at higher Mach number, you essentially have thinner or smaller uh, thick thickness to chord ratio. And the reason that streamwise is written here um, will become clearer um, when we get into swept wings. But essentially, even if you have a swept wing in the flow, the flow is coming this way. Essentially, the, the wing section that the flow, oh, terribly drawn, the wing section that the flow sees is the streamwise T over C. So it's from the point of view of the wing. We could also take a saw and cut it off like this. And then look at the side of it, and that's what it, that's what the flow sees. 
quote sees. Um, and, and we see 14% thick on something like the A10. It has to go, you know, it's a slow speed. It's a very, it has to maneuver, carry big guns, lots of lift. Um, and when we get up in the fighter jet sort of territory, we're talking 4% thick, 5% uh, thick foils, uh, which is pretty impressive. Um, and, and really, I should mention that, you know, I, I think I mentioned in class that you start having structural, you, you two issues, you know, how does this thing handle low speed? Can I actually take off, you know, the deck of a, a carrier? And number two, it has to be strong and carry gas and carry munitions. And so the structural, you have an interplay between optimizing the structure, weight associated with that structure, um, and drag. And those two are going to be competing effects. Um, so this just shows you quickly what happens as you increase the Mach number. There's two important things. One is that the lift coefficient drops right here. So now we're in supersonic flow over here, and we get a, diff for, a different lift from a different mechanism. So we'll talk about that in later lectures. But you can see this lift coefficient is increasing, and then as we approach, and this is for a particular foil, but as we approach uh, the critical Mach number, and it's going to be fairly low for this foil, the drag starts to drop. So that the, the presence of those shocks on the wing leads to a decrease in drag, and as you up the Mach number towards one, it just gets worse. And here are some drag rises. You can see as relatively constant, you get profile drag, and as you approach critical Mach number, you get a small rise, and then it starts to rise precipitously. They all have very similar slopes here as you approach one, which actually is kind of a little bit surprising um, to me. Um, so another way to, dra to delay the drag rise, one was to keep T over C small, so thickness to chord ratio small, or thin wings. Uh, another is to use a totally different type of foil. Uh, and the history of supercritical foils is really, I, th I find, fascinating. I just know a little bit about it, but um, it's definitely worth reading on the web how these sort of came to be and the evolution of foils. You know, there was so much that was developed pre-war um, to do, you know, medium mock, low mock number flight, under the NACA series, understanding the nature of uh, lift and um, and then getting at laminar foils and things like this, but as, as they went towards supercritical uh, the supercritical foils, those foils just don't work very well. So here's an example, this is a typical 64, so we talked about the, actually we didn't talk about these, it's not a 5 series foil, it's a 64 series foil, um, and we see another NACA series, and we see this this very strong shock that's occurring here. So across that shock you have a big pressure jump, a big adverse pressure gradient, big thickness increase in the boundary layer, um, and it affects half the wing. A supercritical foil, such as this one, right here, and we'll look at it in more detail in the next slide, has a totally different flow of it. You see that you don't get to the same high Mach number that you do in this case, and that you can also see that in the pressure coefficient. The pressure coefficient of the of the 64 series rises to a very negative value, jumps to the shock, and then comes back to meet the trailing edge of the, the lower surface. Here it never gets to a very negative number, and, the, and you can see that the, the shock is weak enough that you see that the pressure jump through the shock um, is pretty tame um, compared to uh, this one. So it's been designed, this is a shock, but it's a weak shock. So essentially you accelerate, you decelerate towards Mach, uh, one, and then so our, our jumps conditions are small. The shock is a little stronger on the bottom, and you can see the effect here uh, in the pressure diagram. So the foil shapes are quite unique. They're quite odd looking, um, and really they're, they're credited largely to this person, Richard Whitcomb, Whitcomb who worked at Langley uh, in the 60s. Essentially, he made wings. He, he, just bit, he shaped them with putty and went back to the tunnel. He shaped them with putty and went back to the tunnel. And it was sort of intuition, getting as much information from streaks and pressure distributions that he could, that he was able to morph the shape into one that was totally different. It sort of was fighting against the, the specific things that were causing the drag rag. So that was understood that it was a strong shock occurring far forward was problematic. It led to a loss of lift on the aft upper surface. It led to an increase in drag. How do we deal with that? So one was to basically, the key things are, um, to expand the flow early. Expansion's okay, right? So you have a favorable pressure gradient, you're getting the higher Mach number, that's fine. Um, and then a smooth, very flat top. So there's not much going on here in terms of changes in geometry, a decrease in thickness that would lead to a large adverse pressure gradient, 
and this essentially is very keeps the flow kind of the same here and then pushes all the activity and getting back to free stream conditions towards the aft part of the foil uh, as we saw in the previous pressure distribution back here and I'll, I will show you some simulations of SU2 of a supercritical foil and a regular old NACA foil and you'll see the astounding differences in the flow field at low Mach, kind of similar at, at, at critical or uh, trans um, transonic conditions very different the other key thing is this weird kind of cusp I guess I would call it to the trailing edge you can see we have camber here uh, and the lower surface and the reason for that is you have a loss of lift here um, and so you want to counter that and what this tuck does and we'll see this in the pressure distributions from the SU2 solutions is the flow comes through here accelerates and you actually get high pressure relatively speaking higher pressure here so the contri contribution to lift between the upper and lower surface you, you load it up on the lower surface you get a higher contribution to lift in a transonic foil, the supercritical foil um, so you don't have the loss of lift in the tail end. You also have a reduced separation drag. So again, putty. And so he went through and said, this is, you know, he did this, it was patented, there's a bunch of patents. Um, and it changed the idea. And this foil shape essentially is seen in tons of aircraft at this point. You know, the subtleties are, there's still some subtleties, but the idea is there. Um, but what he discovered was really that there needed to be um, computational method to come in to help sort of guide design. Um, doing it with putty was very painstaking, I guess is the main reason. They're able to do it, but it doesn't give the right guidance. Uh, it's sort of blindly iterating into the night. Um, and this shows a comparison again of those two foils be before. Uh, similar thicknesses, but you can see that the supercritical foil has a drag rise that happens significantly later. Almost uh, the Mach difference is about 0.16. So this is a big difference. So basically if you took your wings that were developed um, in the 30s and stapled them onto these aircraft and said go, go, go to these higher Mach numbers, this is what would happen. You would be pinned at Mach 0.65. If you transform your wings, just change the wings, now you can push Mach 0.8 and if you look at some of the commercial jets, 0 0.82, 0 0.83. And so that is a big difference just by changing the wing shape. It's, it's pretty impressive. So there's some further advances if you Google this patent. I should have put the link. But if you Google this patent, um, there's still some issues where you have an adverse pressure gradient here in the supercritical foil because the foil does come down. They wanted, um, Wickham wanted the foil to come down to meet the trailing edge. And what they said is we split, essentially diverged the trailing and upper edge like this. And the patent reads the sort of strict conditions. Um, it decreases the adverse pressure gradient on this upper foil and the associated thickening of the boundary layer and still maintains this positive pressure, higher pressure that occurs in the lower surface to keep that lift up. So you can have some drag reduction. Um, There's some, Hen and Greg uh, have some patents on this. Actually, McDonnell Douglas has the patents and they did the effort. Um, and this was featured in the MD-11, which is now essentially a retired airplane, but when I was growing up was a, one of the dominant transports. Um, Computational transonic flow. If you're interested in the development of codes, this is a great history that John Vassberg work uh, wrote um, on the development of Flow 22. So this is Anthony Jameson, um, and he was um, brought in uh, by NASA and others, basically in Whitfield's behest to start getting involved in doing computations. It was very difficult at the time. Um, no one really had a sense of how to solve uh, efficiently the equations to get the right flow over wing. And this is even in viscid. Um, so I will um, keep in mind this is early 70s. So this is what they were dealing with in terms of a computer. The 6600, um, this was Cray's uh, first machine they had at the Cron Institute, I believe, and it was one megaflop. Okay, so one megaflop uh, is um, 100,000 times slower than uh, a typical CPU than Intel sells now, a good CPU. Um, so <coughs> they weren't and one megabyte of memory and all the program is punch card. You can read about <coughs> excuse me the, the way they had to carry these boxes of cards around. It was a, it was a different world and um, so Jameson's all about efficiency and doing things in a very compact manner um, and came in and started work on a series of flow codes sort of culminating in flow 22 which allowed for swept wings, 3D um, um, flow, transonic potential flow solutions 
And this was to get at the, the right, sh the challenge was really get the right shock position, the right jump conditions across that shock, and dealing with 3D geometries. Uh, it was very, very, very slow, relatively speaking, computers, fast for their time. Um, there was no viscous effort in there. This came later. Um, so there's a great history in this Flow 22. Um, you can see Jameson Peter there, and he's, he's still active. I'll show one of his modern results in, at the end of this lecture. So another way to delay the drag rise um, is with swept wings. And, and Anderson presents the two points of view. Um, one is that you think about the normal Mach number instead of the free stream Mach number. I like to think of it from the point of view of, of the wing section that the flow sees. So if you slice through this wing here, um, where this is in fact the core of the wing, if we slice through the wing as the stream does, we see uh, the wing sees a different section. So if we slice it this way, and we get our actual section of the wing, it's some foil, say a 15% thick foil would look like this. But the flow comes this way, and when you slice the wing that way, along in the streamwise direction, you have a relatively thinner foil presented to the flow. Here it becomes, for this particular sweep, 45 degree, which would be pretty strong, a 10% thick foil. Um, and so you can get to a higher Mach number before you get to the critical Mach number. Um, so if you have a regular uh, critical Mach number, um, we can adjust for that. So here's your Mach M infinity cos gamma. So um, if, if M infinity, uh, the normal Mach number is here, and we have critical the, the critical uh, Mach number for sweep and critical Mach number for ideal sweep. And so essentially we can knock we can increase our critical Mach number as one over cos gamma, but the issue is um, that in reality the flow doesn't come straight across the wing. In fact, there's a lot of 3D effects, and later I'll show you a solution, a CFD solution. At least you can see how complex really the pressure distribution is over the foil. Um, so in reality, you end up with a critical Mach number that's higher than it would be for a straight wing, but less than it would be if we want to count for this basic swept wing theory, assuming it's fully 2D. But you'll notice that virtually every craft you look at, commercial craft, has swept wings. And when a child draws an airplane, they just like, draw one with swept wings. So um, this is uh, commonplace. So this shows two things. One is the increase in Mach number and drag coefficient for different T over Cs. And you can see that for thinner wings, you have a smaller drag coefficient. And this is testing very simple shapes, a smaller drag coefficient at a given Mach number. And you can see the effect of sweep is the same. As you increase sweep, um, you get a lower drag. Now, increasing sweep also leads to complicated 3D effects, which makes it harder to control stall, and also leads to a loss of lift. And we'll talk about that, both those things, in a later lecture. So you can't sweep forever, and there's an optimal sweep angle. And if you look at the commercial jets, they're all 30 35%, something like that. Um, Variable sweep. So sweep is good when you're at cruise and you're wanting to be cruising along and you're at transonic uh, Mach numbers and it's important to you um, to drop your critical Mach number. But because you have a loss of lift and at low speeds it really doesn't benefit you, um, ideally you'd have this wing for low speeds and takeoff. This is an F-14, which has to take off on a carrier and land on a carrier. So it has to be able to go to handle well at slow speeds, the short runways but also has to be able to go well transonic and supersonic speeds when it's, um, for example, fighting. Um, so the Max Mox 2.4 doesn't spend too much time there. You run out of gas pretty quickly. But this is the wing sweep. So it's a variable sweep wing. You can actually see this photo, and I don't know if this was manipulated or not, but they have one wing out and one wing in. You can see what goes on there. So this was used on a number of fighters, the F-111. Uh, there were some Russian fighters. There is... I think one of the Swedish fighters uses this. I think the B-1B uses this. So it was, I don't know if it was common, but it was used in some scenarios. There's a lot of structure. Of course, you have to think about this has to be a mechanically robust thing. Um, and I think that one thing that has happened is that the evolution of aerodynamics has really enabled people to design wings that are fixed but are able to have a pretty wide flight envelope. So maybe... Uh, this isn't quite as important as it, as it was prior. I'm running out of battery here, so um, hold on one second. I'm going to plug in.
Oops. Um, this just shows, the slide shows the, uh, this is from Mason's lecture, it shows this uh, um, advantage of um, fixed sweep versus, or a variable sweep versus a fixed sweep. Fixed sweep, we have our swept wings here, and you can see the streamwise cord looks something like this, foil looks something like this, um, and you have at, uh, for a variable sweep, we have going from swept to 20 degrees, swept to 68 degrees, so again, this is the Tomcat, the F-14, you have, this is what the flow sees at takeoff and landing, and this is what the flow sees at higher speeds. I should mention one other obvious advantage of the swept wing for carrier-based craft is they can fold their wings back and you can stick more of them in on the deck. Um, so, um, and then there were, have been some forward sweep wings, so, you know, the sweep is arbitrary, right? I can sweep this way or sweep this way. You still have these effects as the flow goes by, um, but there are some differences in particularly in terms of control and stability that have led to using primarily aft sweep, sweep a lot of aircraft. This is an experimental, all the X aircraft are experimental. There's been a few others that have had forward swept wings. Um, one key advantage of it is because of the 3D effects, essentially you have this spanwise flow. So the flow, 2D, two 2D flow will go like this, but you have some spanwise flow that always goes aft. And the complexity of that spanwise flow means that it's more difficult, in a sense, to predict what happens at the root, or I should say on the aft part of the wing, in this case the root. Um, in the case of the aft swept wing, it's the tip. Um, that's sort of the downstream of the spanwise flow. It's more difficult to predict what's going to happen in terms of stall. So um, having the tip be very in a more predictable condition is good because you want your tips to, to tip stall to be well controlled and well understood because that's where you need your control surfaces are, are out here controlling your roll and you want to keep them working properly. Um, and um, But there are some issues in particular with wings like this. If you start to stall and the root, if you start to go to a high angle of attack and the root stalls first, then now your load moves, the, the force on the wing moves forward so you're at a high angle of attack and it stalls and now your center pressure is moving forward, moving forward, it's driving to a higher angle of attack. So essentially that's an instability that you'd have to deal with. Um, there's also some interesting instabilities here. One is uh, noted um, somewhere on the, I guess this is from the Anderson book. Uh, one is um, a yaw instability. So if the plane is subject to a perturbation something like this, um, this wing right here is now going to be relative to the free stream flow at a decreased sweep angle. So maybe it ends up like this, and this one ends up like this. So now this angle, because it's at a decreased sweep, is going to be subject to more drag. Basically, think of it sticking out in the flow more. And it's going to cause even more of a yaw to occur. So that's a yaw instability. Uh, you induce yaw, and the essentially the drag, the differential drag that occurs contributes positively to that yaw such that you yaw even more. Um, so that's a yaw instability. You would not have that in an aft swept wing. Um, and I mentioned something to the effect of this uh, differential between the tip and the root. Um, so you don't see these too often, but just a note um, that they're there. Now in terms of computing things like where's my drag divergence Mach number going to occur given some simple wing parameters, one equation is the Korn equation. We have this kind of, it's very sensitive to this variable kappa, which is sort of a little bit arbitrary um, and difficult. If you were to actually go and calculate the kappa, then you wouldn't be bothering with the Korn equation in the first place. So you can sort of get a sense, at least, of where the drag divergence is going to occur. Um, and the fit of this to some actual data until you get to very high Mach numbers is pretty good. So it's, it's very useful, at least in the early stages, of understanding the effect of lift coefficient, type of foil, and thickness to cord ratio on this mo uh, Mach uh, drag divergence number, and you can make an adjustment to that um, for swept wings where lambda is your angle of sweep. Um, okay, I just want to make one more note, and this comes back to Jameson 
Um, and so he developed a series of these series of flow codes with you know, a lot of people, other people helping out. Uh, they're used at Boeing and other places. Uh, flow, and I should also mention his other codes are called SYN for design, um, his design codes. And this is an effort from the early 2000s using what's called SYN 107. It's code SYN 107. And once you get to the Euler and Navier Stokes series, there's a lot of uh, shared components between these codes. Um, and shows you, here's flow over wing, uh, this wing right here, the Mach number is 0 0.86, this is a 747 wing, and actually the body's here too. And showing the pressure distributions, this is CPs at different stations. So let's look at one station in particular towards the outboard side. So first of all, you can see that there's very different, there's a large variation in the CPs as you move further outboard. So it isn't the same section at each place because you have a lot of spanwise flow and because the foil shape varies from root to tip and that's the nature of a complex Boeing design. You can see here the baseline design is the dashed line and here, let me just zoom in a little bit, on this section right here, this is the upper surface pressure distribution. The baseline 747 wing that he was given has a shock, boom, right there uh, on, in, on the foil. And what his program does is he uses control theory based shape design and essentially it treats the airfoil, think of this as a 2D airfoil, and think of it as a, a splined line. So you use a cubic spline, he doesn't use a cubic spline, but you use a spline to shape the airfoil and you perturb these little points to change it to say a new airfoil shape, maybe something fatter like this. Um, and what general design programs do is they perturb a point Remeasure your cost function, maybe it's drag. What's the new drag with this perturbed point? And then perturb it back. And then they perturb another point, and you can develop a relationship between the cost function and the perturbations of the control points of the wing. And once you do all your perturbations, and each perturbation requires a flow solution to get the drag, then you can use optimization to say, okay, what's my next wing going to be? Um, and if you understand the relationship between drag and shape of each of the control points, what his um, approach does, the control theory based approach, is it uses in a joint uh, a system of equations called the adjoint equations, which enable you to compute that gradient instead of using the number of flow solutions being equal to the number of design points, you just have one shot, essentially solu solving the adjoint, which is similar in cost to the uh, flow solution. So essentially another flow solution. You get the full gradient and then you can get a new iteration of the wing and you repeat, repeat, repeat until it converges. Obviously, you have to keep constraints. In his case, he probably would have put a fixed lift into this case, and he would have put a, um, I'm guessing, some constraint maybe on the leading edge radius, maybe on the thickness to cord ratio, so it wouldn't make a wing that was too thin. So there are some kind of constraints, maybe a bending moment at the root, I'm not sure. But definitely fixed lift. And you can see the drag goes from design zero, which is the baseline. He has 12 counts of drag, or 0.012 down to uh, 0.011 um, drag. And so that's essentially a 10% or 8% reduction in the drag of a 747 wing. And you can see how is this possible. Well, you can see it's possible just, this was a key one here, the shock has been, the shock is essentially erased, it's gone. So he's modified the shape of the wing and it's complex. It's not a 2D thing. This is this is dealing with the full 3D flow and able to be able to do this. You can't do it one section at a time. Um, so very impressive. Uh, he is still very active. He is now in his 80s, I guess, and um, an amazing person. And um, his uh, codes are everywhere, but probably the most accessible to average people now is SU2, um, the Stanford University Unstructured Code, um, which is really spearheaded by his former student and postdoc Juan Alonso. Essentially, in there is, is an object oriented flow solver. Not, you know, it's basically CFD wing targeted, so it's a little like open foam. You can manipulate um, the solvers and such, but uh, it's targeted towards design of aircraft. It's, it's, um, public code. Um, so that's all I wanted to say about that.